people of God. Good to see you this morning. How are we doing? Blessed and highly favored. Yes. All right. Um, we're going to open up in prayer. We just glorify you, Father. We lift you up this morning. We place you in your rightful place, Lord, as we come to worship you together, holding nothing back. Father, we just come to just give you everything that we have. We pray that our praise and our worship just be a beautiful fragrance unto you, Lord. We invite you, Holy Spirit, into this place, into every heart, that our hearts be open to you, that you just have your way this morning. We glorify you and honor you. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.
knowing that you will deliver us. You will deliver us out of Egypt. You will take us from the place that we are and take us to a place that you have created us for. For your will, for your purpose, for your kingdom, God. All things must break before you. Every knee will bow before you. The prideful will become humbled. In your name, Jesus. And we just worship you. Feel it in this room. Holy Spirit, move. When you have your way, something has to break. Tear down every lie, set the wrong thing right. Cause when you have your way, something has to break. Something has to.
worship be a sweet smell unto you this morning, Abba Father. We want to please our God this morning. And we come to worship you in spirit and in truth this morning. Continue the good work you've begun within us, Lord. And minister to your people here this morning, Holy Spirit. We give ourselves over to you here today. And we remember that you are the reason for this season. Thank you, Jesus. We bless you and we praise you and we worship you, Father God. In Jesus' most precious name we pray. Hallelujah. Come on in the church of God says, Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. Who needs to go to a concert? You don't need to go to a concert when we got the BCC worship team here. Amen. Come on, let's give it up for them this, this morning. Wow. A couple of times I had to open my mind, my eyes and just remember I was in church. Amen. So well done this morning, you guys. I love to see our drummer worship. How many drummers do you see worshiping God while they're drumming? Amen. Come on. Hallelujah. It is good to see you in the house of the Lord this morning. Is there any first time visitors here today? I know I've seen some new faces here this morning. Amen. Praise the Lord right here. We got some people. Amen. Let's welcome them this morning. Praise the Lord. Well, church, we're going to have our communion today. We know it's the first of the month. Um, I want to remind everybody this, you know, before we even forget that Christmas is on Sunday. Christmas Day is on Sunday. Where are we going to be on Christmas Day, church? Right Right here in the house of the Lord. This is the reason for the season. It's Jesus. Amen. So if you want to open your gifts at 1201, then open your gifts at 1201 the night before. Get some good rest because we're going to worship on that day. Amen. We're going to praise the Lord that day. Amen. So I just wanted to remind you, church is not off on Christmas. <laughs> That's our busiest day right there. Amen. Where God's going to show himself off once again. So go ahead this morning. Take five minutes uh, to greet one another in the name of the Lord. God bless you this morning.
our seats. <laughs> I was like, whenever Marcos throws on his little selection of music, <laughs> I always want to get down, man. He's he throwing some good stuff on there. Praise the Lord. Somebody give the Lord a hand this morning. Are you glad to be in the house of the Lord? This you're not. <laughs> You're not all crudo at home from last night. You're not in detox jailhouse. You're, <laughs> you're, you're not trying. <laughs> you're not like, oh, my God, my head. <laughs> you're right here in the house of the Lord worshiping the King of kings and the Lord of lords. Amen. Such a good thing to be. Man, I was sick for like a whole week. I was telling Sister Shiloh, I felt like I was backslidden because I wasn't able to be <laughs> in church, man. I was like, oh, thank you, Jesus. Iota. Thank you, everyone, for your prayers. Much appreciated. Got some announcements this morning. Uh, first of all, p please take out your phones and check into the uh, Breakthrough Community Church uh, Facebook page and help others who are searching for a church to find us. And to join us here. How many know we have a good church home right here? Amen. Don't you want somebody else to be able to have a good church home? Amen. Praise the Lord. So make sure you check in and post that on your page. Praise the Lord. Also, Surrendering a Secret. It's a ministry designed to help women heal from the hurt of abortion or sexual abuse. So abortion and sexual abuse can be, they can uh, affect every area of your life. And there is healing amen so there's going to be amen praise the lord so there's an eight week course by kim johnson starting january the 16th somebody say january the 16th january the 16th monday nights amen so there's, uh monday nights at 6 30 p.m to 8 30 p.m here at the church here at bcc amen so there's no need to sign up just come just come there's a there's a flyers uh there should be flyers in the back Amen. Uh, by the uh, whiteboard there. You can see right there where it says coffee. Right to the right of that is the whiteboard. There should be flyers there. Amen. So, and if you have any questions, amen, see Sherry. There's no reason why you shouldn't be able to have a breakthrough, amen, in this area. And, and the Lord is opening up this class, amen, just for you. Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. You can clap if you want to. That was a good cue right there. <laughs> amen. So also, Public Relations is having a food sale today. Amen. Today after service uh, and also on uh, December the 11th as well, there will be pozole, red, and green. Amen. Today. That's today. And then on the 11th, there will be a tamale combo plate. Amen. Let me say it right. Tamale. <laughs> tamale. <laughs> this will be after church. Amen. After church service, all of the proceeds will be going towards upcoming events. Praise the Lord. Um, so you don't definitely want to get get some of that. Amen. Also, it's a new month, so don't forget to stop by the welcome booth and see where that big white and black sign says, Welcome to the family. That's the welcome booth. Amen. Stop that by there for an updated bulletin so you can see what's going on here at BCC. And then all our ministries that are available to you. And the welcome booth also has all information if you're interested in volunteering in one of the different ministries. Amen. So if you want to be a part, we'll make you a part. Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. Also, uh, last, um, we, uh, we will be starting coming. How many were able to be a part? of the uh spiritual life teaching course that we did that pastor did amen we did it i don't know it's been a little while since we've done it but powerful powerful it's going to be taken we're going to be starting that up again and um it's going to be on uh january the 15th sunday evenings at 6 p.m here at the church so uh, uh january the 15th you're going to want to write this down amen because uh a lot of us were saved amen we're saved. How many are saved? Is anybody saved in here? Brother Rich is saved. <laughs> We're saved, but we don't know a lot of the, we, we have questions, right? We don't know a lot of the doctrinal truths, the foundational truths uh, for which we believe, amen? So 
definitely want to be a part of that. It's going to be a course on the spiritual life or foundations of faith. And it will be one hour, a one hour course. And pastor's pretty good about sticking to that one hour. So, you know, I'll be like, yeah, I'll go Sunday night, but they're going to take long. And no, it's just one hour. He sticks to that hour. It's, it's really good. So you'll want to you want to be a part of that. And you so you will also need to uh, print out the, the book. That, that There's a book in, uh, that, that we're going to be going through. Pastor has that book. So uh, if you're interested in being a part of that class, see Pastor, and he'll give you the book so you can co make copies and, and print out the book for yourself to be a part of that. Amen? Amen. <laughs> Somebody clapped back there. I don't know. <laughs> it's going to be... Uh, 6 o'clock, 6 p.m. on Sunday evenings, and we're in the first class will start January the 15th. Amen? Amen? <laughs> Mercy. We'll work on that. <laughs> Amen. Uh, now at this time, if you need a prayer card or a tithing envelope, please raise your hand, and the ushers will be glad to bring you. They've got somebody over here and over there. The ushers will bring one to you. Amen. There's several ways to give here at BCC. Amen. You can give online through BreakthroughPeoria.com or by downloading the Tithe.ly app directly to your phone. If you would like to mail your tithe, somebody says, what's that? Not email, mail. We used to do that way back in the day. You'll need a stamp. And <laughs> Amen. You can, you can, tithe, you can uh, send your tithes and offerings in the mail. The address is on the screen. And also post it in your comments if you're watching on live Facebook, the live Facebook feed. Amen. Praise the Lord. As the ushers come up, we're going to say a prayer over our tithes and offerings. Amen. You guys ready? Amen. Let's, Father God, we just thank you, Lord. We have what we have because of you. And we have it for your purpose, for your plan. We give. For your purpose, your plan. I pray your blessing upon the gift and the giver, Father. Do what you have planned to do, Lord. We give you all the praise and all the honor and glory because you're the only one that's worthy of it. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you as you give. You don't raise your hand and our ushers can get you one amen we need one over here a couple over here amen praise the lord so if you would just begin to prepare your heart for communion amen 
Uh, before we take communion, my wife's going to sing a song, and then I'm going to share something, and then we'll partake together. Good morning, everyone. Uh, the song that I'm going to sing this morning is called It Is Well, and um, my heart came very heavy to church today because I know there's a lot of hurting people. And I pray every day that God softens my heart to help me love people the way that he does. <laughs> so I'm crying because I see there's such a need for people who are hurting, who are going through things that come through these doors. And we need just to love them, to be patient. So I pray that um, these words would touch your heart and take root. <laughs> to God be the glory.
This morning we are invited to the Lord's table. The first Sunday of each month, regardless of where we have been, what we have done, what we have left undone, whether we have won great battles or suffered a great defeat, there is an invitation to the Lord's table, and none will be rejected if we come with a heart of repentance. Some communion Sundays, we can reflect back on a great month, a month of blessing and goodness, a month of joy, promotions, financial success, food to eat and clothes to wear, peaceful relationships, well-behaved children and a well-behaved spouse, and no arguments. <laughs> Some communion Sundays, we can reflect back on a month we rather would forget, a month that has been plagued with death, loss of loved ones, financial struggles, holes in shoes and no money to buy new ones, fights among family members and friends, relationships perhaps broken beyond repair, sleepless nights and restless days, a month of more questions than answers, a month of change when we need stability, and the good news is there is still an open invitation to the Lord's table. Each one of us is a mix of sinner and saints, of struggle and victory, of lost and found, of broken and the redeemed. So there is still an invitation to his table. It was the love of God that reserved a seat at this table for you and I. It was the love of God through the death of his son that we can truly sing it as well. And know without a doubt, we have the victory in Jesus. You see, love won when Jesus hung on a cross and said, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. Love won when Jesus looked at a man on another cross receiving the judgment and penalty for his actions that, de that he deserved. And he said, today you will be with me in paradise. Love won when on the third day Jesus rose from the dead as he had promised so we would never experience death as separation. But so as his disciples and children, we can experience everlasting life. Love won when the gift of the Holy Spirit descended upon the early believers on the day of Pentecost, that the same Spirit is given to dwell in each and every one of us. Love won when we were baptized and sealed by God. Love already had won when Jesus spoke about bread at his as his body and wine as his blood to be offered. And the greatest single act of love in all history. So yes, love has won. So there is an invitation to the table an invitation to each and every one of us to live a life worthy of the call we have received, to be completely humble and gentle, to be patient, bearing with one another, to make every effort to keep the unity of the spirit through the bond of peace, because there is one body and one spirit, just as you were called to one hope when you were called, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all who is over all and through all. Through this invitation, we can receive the faith, hope, and love that is offered. And the greatest of these is love. So yes, love has won. But not human love. Rather, the lavish and fierce and unrelenting, pursuing, holy, and perfect love of God for each and every one of us. Here and everywhere, now and forever. This morning, if you would stand with me as we partake of communion. No matter where we've been, no matter what we've done, as earliest as when we walk through these doors, there's still an invitation. If you think about it for just a minute, he knew that Judas would betray him, and there was still an invitation. He knew that Peter would deny him three times, and yet there was still an invitation. This morning, wherever you're at, whatever you've done, there is still an invitation. Before we take communion, just for a few seconds, I want you just to examine your heart. And whatever's going on, whatever you need to repent of, just do that. Amen? Just take a few minutes.
1 Corinthians 11, 23, 25, it says, For I received from the Lord that which I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus on the same night in which he was betrayed took bread, and we had given thanks, he broke and it said, Take, eat, this is my body which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Go ahead and break and take and eat. In the same manner, he also took the cup after supper, saying, This is the cup of my new, uh, the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink in remembrance of me. Go ahead and drink. Hallelujah. Father, we just thank you, Lord God, that in spite of who we are, God, in spite of our faults and our failures, Lord, you do not reject us from coming. So, Father, we thank you, Lord God. We remember, Lord God, your sacrifice this morning and all that you did, God, for each and every one of us. Father, we thank you this morning. And we're grateful, Lord God, that you do not reject us from coming. Father, we thank you. Praise you. In Jesus' name. be seated. Praise the Lord. In the beginning, we were having a few technical difficulties, so I just wanted to uh, give a warm welcome to those who are here for the very first time today. Tisha, Anais, I said that right, right? Because we have an Amaris too. So, I, you know, you guys are confusing me here. But <laughs> <laughs> David, welcome this morning. Monique and Chris, welcome to Breakthrough Community Church this morning. <laughs> Praise God. All right. Well, you know, I was uh, in prayer earlier this week and... Um, I was actually, I was going down the road here by the mall, and, uh, you know, when you live this close to a mall, this time of year, uh, the, you have extra people, especially in Arizona. The snowbirds come in, the shopping starts to get crazy, the mood starts to change, and I noticed a pattern every time that I went down Bell Road, which during the holiday seasons I call Hell Road, because, uh, you know, it takes you an hour and a half to get to Surprise if you're going that way. Um, so I know, right? Um, so I started to notice the mood of different people and what the mood was, was anger. It was anger. And the reason why it was anger is because they're complaining about the traffic. They're complaining about the traffic because they're out there worried about what to buy, where to eat, what to do. And the Lord started to show me actually a couple of months ago in October have you noticed now how early they start to put things out for Halloween? Does everybody notice that? Like, it's like two months away. They're already got the stuff coming out, the little skeletons and all the, the weird stuff that they do for Halloween. And so I thought to myself, you know what? I don't see why we can't start celebrating Christmas today, Sunday. So I'm going to give you a Christmas message, and I'll give you another Christmas message next, next week. And then the following week, uh, Sherry's going to close it off with another Christmas sermon. Amen. So I have a little spin on today's Christmas sermon, um, and it's having the right kind of Christmas. Because we don't want to get into the, what, what the world is getting into right now with all the stress and all the things. We want, uh, uh, we want our Christmas to go the way it's supposed to go. And who is the reason for the season? Jesus. We want the tree, we want the decorations, you know, the eggnog, the presents, uh, the right music, you know, all those types of things. Um, but we need to remember why it is we celebrate what we celebrate. Sometimes Christmas, to some, becomes more of a burden than it does a blessing. Amen? So I wanted to kind of recap and go back on why we celebrate 
uh, throughout the, I, I think we should extend Christmas. We should start doing Christmas and Christmas sermons and preachings and teachings um, more this time of year than ever. Now, if you have your Bibles with you this morning, you can turn them to the book of John chapter 1. And um, I'm going to go through this text. Uh, it's not a traditional Christmas text. Um, but, you know, he doesn't write about the stars, the sheep, you know, the shepherds, the angels. But he does get into the reason of the season. Amen. And so in John chapter 1, verses 1 through 5, the word of God reads this. And I usually read from the New King James. It'll be up here on the, on the prompters as well. In the beginning was the word. And the word was with God. And the word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through him, and without him nothing was made that was made. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. And the light shines in the darkness, and the darkness did not comprehend it. Let's pray this morning. Father, in the name of Jesus, I pray over your people here today. And I ask, Lord God, that they would have an open heart, an open spirit, an open mind, Father God, to your word. Let them be be receptive, Father, to your word this morning. Uh, Let there be change, Father. Let us not walk out of this place the same. Give us a new revelation in some way, shape, or form this morning, Father. We bless you. We praise you. In Jesus' name, amen. So in this portion of Scripture here, this is actually the reason for the season here. We have to consider in this time of year, the reason for the season is because of the the person of Christmas is Jesus Christ. You know, um, Christmas is filled with a bunch of distractions. You know, uh, if you see, there's the distraction of Santa Claus. There's the distraction of Rudolph the Red-Nosed Reindeer. There's the distraction of Frosty the Snowman, right? Having a white Christmas instead of a right Christmas is what's been uh, happening in, in the days past. And so we need to bring those things back. So if we consider the person of Christmas, it is Jesus, and it is who the Bible is talking about here in John chapter 1, verses 1 through 5. Now, who he is, is he is eternally God. He started off as God, if you can put, uh, I mean, in our mind, we cannot comprehend a beginning. So in our minds, we have to comprehend he was there in the beginning. He was there before the beginning. He is the beginning, right? Right? And it tells us here in John chapter 1, in the beginning was the word. Now, this phrase doesn't simply imply that the word had a beginning. It means that he always existed. He's always been there. He's always been present. And this word is in, the word word in this portion of scripture in verse 1 is in what they call the imperfect tense. Now, it signifies an action of the past that continues into the present kind of like uh, the cold that's going around right now right the flu or the cold some of us um have had it for like two three weeks now and we still have like the little tickle right it's something that lingers and lingers and lingers don't want to go away well guess what jesus is never going to go away he is never going to go away he will always be there he's always been there and he'll always continue heaven and earth will pass away the word of god says but my word will never pass away amen and i love that So it could also be read this way. In the beginning was the word, is the word, and will always be the word. Amen? So we can kind of bring it closer to us so we can understand it a little better that way. The word is eternal. He has always been and always will be. Before there was anything else, there was the word. Jesus was not plan B. Amen? Did you know that? You know, sometimes when we're going through a trial, he's our plan B. We try to take care of things on our own. And how many of you guys are really, really good at taking care of things on your own? (laughs) Look where it got us, right? Amen. I, you know, we all tried to kick something at some point in time in our life that still lingers around because day after day, year after year, decade after decade, we tried to get rid of it and it still lingers with us. Right? There's something there. It's our sin nature. We cannot. Do you know that you're not going to get rid of your sin nature till you go home to be with the Lord? That means that we're going to have a thought process that goes against the grain of the Holy Spirit. Goes against the grain of the word of God. And we're going to have to contend with that until we're made perfect in Christ Jesus when we go home to be with the Lord. 
A couple of months ago, or uh, uh, a couple of months before Christmas, the wife of a mail carrier was killed in a car accident. The husband was overcome with grief and was trying to work through his sorrow. And he had stayed late at the post office, sorting through the mountain of mail that always comes at Christmas time. His job that day was to go through the mail that had been lost and to find out where it should be rerouted to. He came across a letter that was addressed to Santa Claus, and he noticed that the address at the top of the letter was his own address. So he opened the letter. Looking down at the bottom of the page, he saw that it was his only daughter's signature, and it read this. Dear Santa, my mom died two months ago, and since then, my daddy has been crying himself to sleep every night. And he says that only eternity will heal him. Will you please send a little bit of eternity to my dad for Christmas? Well, guess what God did, the Father? He sent Jesus a gift from eternity. Times past and times present and times future. He has already given us a gift that continues to give and give and give. Isn't there a commercial about that? The, ki- the gift that continues giving? That's not a diamond. It's not a car. There is nothing else, no other gift that can give the way Jesus can give. He started time off by giving, didn't he? John 3, 16, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, right? He is a giver. Look at the person next to you and say, are you a giver? We have to ask ourselves that question, especially during this time of year. Uh, sometimes we only worry about what we're going to get for Christmas, right? Some of you guys are like, ooh, Christmas time. I can't wait. Even do the little clap, the happy clap. <laughs> right? <laughs> what am I going to get? Guess what? You already got it. It's the Holy Ghost. You have him now. That is the gift that continues to give. Well, God not only sent us a little bit of eternity, but he sent us the very heart of heaven. John, later on in the epistle, he wrote this. And we have seen, this is 1 John 4, 14. And we have seen and do testify that the Father sent the Son to be the Savior of the world. He is equally God. He is God in the flesh. Amen. This word translated, the word word, is translated in the Greek as what? Logos. Now, what this refers to is speech, reasoning, explanation, or a word about something. It's not just a word, but it's an explanation of everything that you need to know. That's who Jesus is. Jesus is the express image of God. Hebrews talks about him being the express image of God, and it says that he... uh, The uh, image, the word image, and you've heard me say this before, is the Greek word icon. You guys know what an icon is. When you go on your computer, what comes up? An icon. And if you want to see the little G, what's behind the little G, you click on it and it says what? Google. And then you can get into a vast array of different things and get more knowledge about things. Um, Do you guys remember dictionaries? (laughs) Do you remember when you had a big set of encyclopedias? And it took up your whole bookshelf at your house? You remember that? (laughs) It's still there. (laughs) Do you remember all the dust it collected? Because you never really like to look things up anyways. Right? But now we have Google. Right? Well, guess what? Jesus is the Google. If you want to know about God, he's the icon. You click on him. And he will tell you everything about the Father and everything about himself. He is the icon. I-K-O-N. That's where that word came from. He is the exact representation of God. Click on Jesus. He's equally God. Jesus is everything God has ever said or will say. He is everything God is about in human form. In John 14, 18, the word declared is there, but it means to be led out, to explain, or to na- uh, navigate, narrate, I'm sorry, to narrate. That's where we get the word exegesis from, from this word. It's an explanation or a narration of God and who he is. The word with means this. This is what I love right here. The word was with God. That's what it says in verse 1, right? It means face to face or forward. Hmm? 
The word was with God, face to face with God. Guess what? That's not something you or I can do. Amen? Only one, and that's Jesus. He's the only one, the express image that can look face to face with God. But I thought God is God and Jesus is Jesus. Well, we'll get into that in a little bit here. Because some people get confused, right? Especially when the Mormons or whoever they are, Jehovah's Witness come knocking on your door, and you give them uh, John 3, 16, begotten son, right? They say, well, yeah, that means he was born. Yes, he was born, but he always was. He was always there, right? He's always been there. He, hasn't just, he wasn't just born that day. Only in the flesh was he born to show you and I who God is. And what this does is it reminds us that we serve a triune God. God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. There is one God who manifests himself in three different persons. The Word, Jesus, and is one of those manifestations. So when we are praying in the Spirit, what spirit are we praying in? The Holy Spirit. That's what reveals himself and reveals what the Word is trying to say. If you're trying to read the Word of God and it's not just clicking with you, then ask the Lord, Lord, I need your Holy Spirit now to reveal to me the revelations in your word, because sometimes we just don't get it. And then you have to start to probe and you have to start to learn and you have to start to, you know, even if you got to Google some things, you know, and check your sources. Amen. He is essentially God. The statement and the word was God is the clearest statement of the deity of Jesus in the Bible. Not only is he co-eternal and co-equal with God, but he is the word of God. Can you imagine, like, remember I walked around last week and was just tapping people on the shoulder? Imagine you not understanding the word, and God sends Jesus. And then all of a sudden, this revelation starts coming to you, starts touching you, starts showing you things. Do you remember when you were lost? What it was the word like then to you? You didn't care to read it. You didn't care to listen to it. You didn't care to obey it. But when we gave our heart to Jesus, then we started to want those things and to learn more. That was another reason why I really wanted to start the class again um, in January. It was a course that I took, if for some of you that don't know. Uh, about 25 years ago um, through Calvary Chapel Bible College, and it's just the basics of, of Christianity. And I think for those who want to come out, you're going to love the material that's in it. One hour, Sunday nights, I want to encourage you to, to, to come. You never know what God can do in an hour. Amen? You never know what he can do in a minute. In one minute, my life was changed. In one minute, Rich's life was changed. Patrick's life was changed, right? Nikki, it's taken a little longer, but you know what I mean? <laughs> but she's getting there. She's, she's doing good, Nick. Keep it up. Amen. He is essentially God, co-eternal. I can't say I and the Father are one. I can't say that. Only Jesus can say that. When God sent his son into this world, this is my son in whom I am well pleased. He sent the one who is eternally, equally, and essentially God. So basically, a Christmas story is bragging about Jesus and who he is and who he is not. Amen? In other words, when we, the angel said, unto you a son is born this day in the city of David, a Savior, which is Christ the Lord, they were announcing the birth of God in the flesh. Oh, man, I, you know, we think to ourselves, you know, uh, I have trouble with faith because I can't see Jesus. I have trouble believing because I haven't seen miracles. I need a miracle to know that there's Jesus. Show me first, and then I'll believe. What is faith, according to the Bible? Faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. It's believing the unseen, because Jesus isn't walking around here with us right now. We have a hard time believing at times, don't we? That's why sometimes I'll walk around and say, just imagine, imagine if I was Jesus. I mean, I'm not, you know, you guys know that I'm not, right? Okay, so if I tell you to drink the Kool-Aid, don't drink the Kool-Aid. Amen? 
But when I go around doing that sometimes, every once in a while I'll do that to remind people that Jesus is in the house. He is here, and because we don't see him with our eyes, does not make him any less real. Our God lives. He is alive. And he hears your prayer, he hears your cry, and he hears your plea. He sent one who is eternally equally God. Now, next, I'm going to talk about the power of Christmas. In verse 3, the word of God says this. All things were made through him. Say through him. And without him, nothing was made that was made. If I were to ask you to tell me what you think the greatest manifestation of God's power is, you'll all have different answers, right? Many of us will have different answers. Some would say creation. Some would say miracles. Others would say the cross, right? Some would even say the the resurrection. But I'd say that the greatest expression of God's power was when he added humanity to his deity. That means being all God and all flesh at the same time. That's what deity is, right? And came to live amongst men when we didn't get it, when they didn't get it. I can only imagine God just sitting up there saying, I'm going to have to send an example of myself, an exact representation so that my people can come back to me. So that they can repent. Amen. Christmas. That's what it's about. Coming back to Jesus. We have to center ourselves away from the gifts. I'm not saying don't go buy gifts for your children. And put this Grinch in front of your house. And say no we're not doing this or that. I am not saying that. I'm saying let's focus on the real reason for the season this month. If they can celebrate Halloween for a couple months. Why can't we celebrate our God? For a couple of months. Amen. Although his life proved who he was over and over again. From him saying peace be still. To rise up and walk. To Lazarus come forth. To your sins have been forgiven. To even saying it is finished. The truth of the power of his deity. Was always on display. Constant display of who he is. And guess what. If you look at the person next to you right now. There's your miracle. There's your peace. But I'll tell you something. When I've seen certain people walk in here one way, and then year after year, I see the Lord chipping away, chipping away, chipping away. When I see myself and how I used to be, and every time that old man wants to rise up again, especially when I'm driving, you know, with the traffic here on Bell with the snowbirds, right? Is, are there snowbirds here? Because I don't want to offend nobody. People get offended easy these days, don't they? Amen. If you're a snowbird, welcome to Arizona. There's another mall in Chandler. (laughs) Amen. You can go there. The prices are better, I hear. (laughs) The power of Christmas. He's the maker of creation. The maker of creation. When you consider that this verse tells us that Jesus was the creator of the universe, his birth as a baby becomes even more amazing than that, doesn't it? The creator of creation humbled himself and be, actually became a creature of creation. Now, isn't that a mind blower when you have a king that is a king of all the other kings and he humbles himself to be like you and I? Did he have to do that? He did not have to do that. Some of us have issues with tithing or giving money. But I'll ask you something. For those of you who don't, can you imagine if the world asked you for your only son? That's what the world needed. The world needed. And guess what? God the Father gave that to you. And guess what? Because Jesus is God, he agreed to that cross. The very cross here, the reason why we don't have Jesus on the cross is because he's no longer on the cross. He's risen. He is alive. And he is healing you still today. (laughs) Jesus was the agent of creation and he stepped out of eternity, laid aside his glory and entered the world as a human baby. A human baby. A fragile little baby that needed to be taken care of. Imagine that. 
the king of kings and the Lord of lords had to cry out for milk. Had to cry out to be changed. Had to cry out to be uh, handled, carried, rocked to sleep at night. The creator of all things. Everything was made through him and for him. And yet, here he is as a little baby. Humble, meek. But at the snap of a finger, could change everything. Everything. Hmm. That's a reason... Right there to just be in awe of God during this season. That is the power behind Christmas. It's not this season. uh, That's why this season is not about tinsel. It's not about packages. It's not about parties, bows, boxes, meals. It's not about the mistletoe. It's not about any of those things. It is about the maker of creation. Jesus. He's also the master of creation. Now. I find this really interesting. It's why I'm using it again in this sermon. I did this in another sermon. But the word of God, not only did he make this universe, but he holds the power that holds it all together. That's what Colossians 1, 16 uh, and 17 says. It says this, for by, all him, for by him all things were created that are in heaven and on earth, Visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or principalities or powers, all things were created through him and for him. And he is before all things, and in him all things consist. Huh? That is the word, that word right there, consist. It means, uh, that's what it means. As one man put it, he is the glue to the galaxies. He holds it all together. Now, I don't know about you guys, but, you know, every once in a while, I get to thinking that I'm a mechanic. And when I'm trying to fix my 50-year-old car or my 52-year-old truck, I try to fix things. And when I can't fix it or bolt it in right, then guess what I do? I try and use, what do I do? Oh, yeah, I do that too. (laughs) She says, you break it. (laughs) Well, that's when I'm in the flesh. You know what I mean? I haven't prayed before trying to fix my car. But what I do is I try to put tape on it. You know the old saying, right? Ponle tape, right? Sometimes I'll get real creative and I'll do sticky tape, double-sided 3M, the good stuff. Sometimes I'll use Gorilla Glue. Then I'm getting real serious, but I never want to see this part come off again. And I'll just go, right, the whole thing. But that's what we do in our spiritual walk and in our lives. When we don't allow Jesus, the one who knows what he's doing, like when I don't want to take my car to the mechanic who knows what they're doing, and I try to do things myself, I go for a quick fix. There it is. The quick fix. You see, Jesus is the glue to the galaxy. So I'm sure he can hold your life together. Can you imagine the distress that you're in over the holidays, the people that you're missing that are no longer here, all those things. You know, he could heal that broken heart. He can fill that empty void. Only he can because he is the glue, the glue that holds things together of the galaxy. He made it and he holds it together too. Think of it this way. Man can't really make anything that runs as it should. But take a look at our planet and realize that it does not travel in a true circle. It travels around three directions at the same time. It revolves on its axis. It travels around the sun. And its path is deflected by other planets. Still, it does not lose more than one hundredth of a second every hundred years. You know why? Because he's in control. We look at the building block of the universe, which is an atom, so small that only a micro, uh, 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 that you can only see it through a microscope. An entity so small that each atom is less than 150 millionth of an inch in diameter. So the human eye, there's no way that you can see it, right? If you take the molecules of a single drop of water, convert them into grains of sand, there would be enough sand to build a concrete half. Uh, highway half a mile wide, one foot thick, 
all the way from New York to San Francisco. And there are 120 drops of water in a single teaspoon. He holds it all together. Combine that with the fact that one cell from your body contains 200 billion molecules of atoms. Whether you look at the universe with a telescope and see how big it is, or you look at the universe with a microscope, microscope and see how small it is, um, either way, he holds it all together. He is in control. So what does this mean? Is he in control of your Christmas? Is he? Is he the one that's in charge of your Christmas? How many of you guys, uh, if you can be honest with me here this morning and honest with the church, how many of you guys during just this time where Christmas season has started right after Thanksgiving have already been stressed out about something concerning Christmas? You see, what happens with Christmas is we go out and look for presents for people that got everything. We go out and look for presents for people we don't even really care for. We go out and get presents of people that already have one or two of those things. We all know somebody that is the hardest person to shop for because they got it all. And yet we stress about those things. We need to start stressing a little more about how we can get closer to the Lord and bring Christmas back into our home the way it's supposed to be. Amen. He is the reason for the season. The one who made it all and controls it all was born into this world 2,000 years ago as a helpless infant. He lived in poverty, in rejection, only to die a horrible death on the cross. He did it all because he loves you. That's love. That's love. So what is the power of Christmas? Is it Santa Claus in a red suit taking toys to all the good little children? Can you imagine if God... (laughs) Jesus, the Holy Spirit, had a naughty list. Because he don't make that list and check it twice. He checks it every second. Every second. Would you be deserving of a gift then? Which one would you be on? What list would you be on? Sylvia, you're a saint. He's going to leave you alone. (laughs) Amen. Can you imagine if the Lord himself had a naughty list and checked it? With some of us, he would have to check, 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 check with most of us. Well, Pastor, I don't drink. I don't smoke. I don't do this. I don't do that. I'm not a womanizer. I'm not a... Well, no. But look at your heart and look at your mind. You see, we're good at being good with things on the outside. We come to church with that smile on our face, but inside we're carrying some things, right? We're carrying some stuff. What a great gift to give to Jesus this year. That stuff. Because that stuff will hold you down. That stuff will pull you back. That stuff will make you think that you're not good enough for Jesus. And you know what? The truth of the matter is, is that we're not. We're not. None of us. None of us. Not even you, Sylvia. (laughs) Amen. Oh, he told you different? I'll call him later and ask him. <laughs> I think he's going to have to check that twice. Right? Let's keep moving forward. It's not about a snowman. It's not about elves. It's not about presents. It's not about huge meals, family get-togethers. The power of Christmas is God in the manger. This is the power of Christmas. The reason why we celebrate this season is because he is the essence of this season. The whole entire story of Jesus is this season. Let's go back to John 1, verse 4 and 5. This is the purpose of Christmas here. In him was life, and the life was the light of men, and the light shines in the darkness, and the darkness doesn't comprehend it. Hmm. So the question that begs this morning is why? Why did the creator desire to become part of his creation? Why did God put on human flesh and walk among men? Why did he come to this world to live knowing that he was going to die the way he did? Hmm? I'll tell you why. Because he wanted to bring life into dead men. 
Because believe it or not, church, without the Lord, we're dead men walking. That's what we are. You guys ever watch zombie movies? Hmm? If you watch zombie movies, then you know. You know already. They're just walking around and they only got one thing on their mind. And that's satisfying their flesh. Right? By eating something. Whatever it's brains or whatever they put in the movies now. Right? Who knows what it is now? Pizza? I don't know. <laughs> right? <laughs> but without Jesus Christ, we are dead. It's why we don't understand the word. It's why it's difficult for us to pray. Because there's the death of a man. There's the death of a woman. That the further we get away from God, the further that we get away from his spirit, his son, the death of man begins. That's the beginning of our end. The further we get away from Jesus and his spirit and his father, the more we're dying inside. The more we try to handle things in our own power in our own flesh, in our own mind, thinking, I got this. I'm so smart. I've taken care of myself all these years. I can do it another year without God. I can make it through another Christmas without God. I'm a single parent. I can make it happen. I'm strong. You know how many strong people I talk to on a weekly basis that are crumbling inside? They're dying inside. Hmm? Because they won't let go. They won't forgive. The word doesn't tell us that we have to forget. Only he has the power to forget. He throws our sins as far as the east is from the west into the sea of forgetfulness. We can forgive. But we're not divine to forget. But we don't have to bring it up anymore. And we can truly lay that at the feet of the altar. And allow our father to heal us so that we can move forward. Otherwise, it will haunt you. It's like a bad movie. It's like a zombie movie. And that zombie will become you. You'll be more dead the more you allow it to attack you, to bite at you, to gnaw at you, to vex you. Hmm? And we have to give that to Jesus. We have to lay it at the altars, not picking it up when we go back to our seats. The purpose of Christmas. Oh, man. He came to bring life into deadness. When Jesus came into the world, he entered a world filled with dead men, but these dead men don't know that they are dead. There was a farmer years ago, and he was trying to teach his son the ways of life on a farm. So he took his son to the hen house. He grabbed the chicken and said, son, your mom wants chicken for dinner. So you know what we have to do. And with that, he cut the chicken's head off, and the chicken began to flop around on the ground. And while the little boy's eyes were wide with amazement, he said, Dad, look at that. That there chicken doesn't even know that it's dead. Without Jesus, some people don't even know that they're dead spiritually. Because only Jesus can tell you, only I give life and life more abundantly. Right? That's who our God is. Jesus came so that dead men can live. When a dead, lost man feels Jesus, he passes from the dead man to the alive man. When the dead man becomes alive in Jesus, everything in his life begins to change for the better. Mondo, do you remember the dead man? Is he still dead? Amen. We can be one person. But when we allow Jesus to come in, not only to forgive us, but to set us free from the things we used to be or do, then we have an, an actual shot at life, life more abundantly. When we're not holding on to the past, well, they hurt me. Yeah, people hurt us. And sometimes life isn't fair. I've said this to many people before. The people who God directs me to say uh, this too. And I'll tell you this morning what I say. Sometimes to people when they have that hurt, that they just can't get over. I'll give you a revelation is what I tell them. That God gave me when I was hurt. You're never going to hear and I'm sorry from you. But we have to move on. And we have to forgive. Because as long as you don't forgive, then guess what? You'll never forget. That's for sure. You'll never see the heart of Jesus. As long as you have unforgiveness in your heart, you can come to this altar 
And you can pray the greatest, most eloquent prayer in the world. You can show the grace, the mercy of God. You can lift your hands. You can cry out. But until you give it to Jesus, then guess what? Your prayer is going to get about as high as that ceiling and no further. So how about today we give unforgiveness? How about today we pray for peace instead of unforgiveness? Is it hard to forgive? Jerry, is it hard to forgive? Nikki, is it hard to forgive? Celine? But you know what? These people have overcome some crazy, crazy things in life. But they were able to forgive, and they're prospering and flourishing in the things of God. Why? Because they made a decision one day. I'm going to forgive. I'm sure you remember all the things that took place that caused you to have that feeling, right? We do. But they made the conscious decision to move forward. And that's what you and I need to give to the Lord today. What a gift. What a gift you can give God. Not only by being here, but to give him something so that he can move you forward in his name. Jesus is the strength of early life. We are alive today only by his good grace. He makes it possible. Jesus is the secret of effective life. It's been said that three things make life worth living. First, a self fit to live with, a faith fit to live by, and a purpose fit to live for. And only Jesus can make all three of those happen in your life. He gives life and he gives it abundantly. That word abundantly means superior, extraordinary, surpassing, uncommon. This is the kind of life Jesus wants to give you. If you will listen to him, if you will forgive. Real living is more than walking, talking, eating, breathing, loving. Real life, the abundant life, is a joyful life, and it's found only in knowing God through Jesus Christ, his son. That's the only way. You wanted to know the secret? There it is. It's no longer a secret. And it should be a secret that we don't keep to ourselves because someone as close as two seats down from you cannot know that secret yet. Do you know what's going on with the person in the row behind you? The row in front of you? Have you made an effort to be other-minded rather than self-minded? Especially during this time of year. He came to bring light into darkness. He is the source of eternal life. You see, now a person who does not know Jesus is more than just spiritually that doesn't know Jesus is more than spiritually dead. He's also spiritually darkened. Jesus came to change all of that. You know, we used to think a wrong way, didn't we? Remember when we used to want vengeance? When we used to want payback? Oh, you're going to do that? Okay. Just you wait and see what I got for you. Is that just pastor? Or? Ah, I knew it. Wrong church. I'll go to CCV. <laughs> He came to bring light into darkness. Jesus said this in John chapter 8, verse 12. I am the light of the world. He that follows me shall not walk in darkness, but shall have the light of life. I love that. Acts 26, 18. Actually, let me go to Ephesians 5, 8 first. For once you were in darkness, but now you are the light in the Lord. Walk as children of light. I'm winding down. Acts 26, 18, to open their eyes and to turn them from darkness to light and from the power of Satan unto God, that they may receive forgiveness of sins and inherit among them which are sanctified or separated by faith that is in me. Jesus came into this world to bring light to you. How many of you like darkness? Do you like darkness? I know I don't like darkness at all. I always have to have some kind of little light just so that I can see. You know, um, I started leaving the lights on on the porch because it, there's a little crack that shines into the bedroom. Because, you know, sometimes you wake up in the middle of the night, you start walking, right? And what do you do? Boom. 
You stub your toe on something, right? That either one of the kids left there. But see, when we're in darkness, we stumble on silly little things all the time, don't we? Well, that person had attitude. And then you do the neck thing, and I don't know how to do that real good because I don't do the neck thing. <laughs> but I know people that do. They're, they're good about bobbing that neck, right? <laughs> huh? <laughs> Amen? It's easy for us to stumble on things when we're not in the spirit or when we haven't been enlightened by God. Little things will irritate you. Little things. Don't you hate it when somebody says, what's the big deal? Ooh, you know, those are fighting words. What's the big deal? Well, it may not be a big deal to you, but it is to them. Isn't that true? That's a whole thing. I'll do a thing on marriage next year, and then we'll, we'll deal with that issue. Amen. There's a story about, and I'm closing with this. There's a story about a drunk that was down on all fours late one night under a street light. And he was moping around the ground and he was filling the cement, trying to find something. And a friend walked up to him and said, Sam, what are you doing down there? He said, well, I lost my wallet. So the friend gets down on all hands and knees and they both start looking for the man's wallet. Neither one can find it. And finally, the friend says to his drunk buddy, are you sure you lost the wallet here? Well, no. In fact, I dropped it a half a block back over there. He said, well, then why are we looking here? He said, because there's no light over there. <laughs> but you see, that's just what a lost world does. They look in the darkness when the light is nowhere near. We have to look to Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith. They reject it when it comes their way. In John 3, 19, this is what the Bible says. And this is the condemnation that light is come into the world and men loved darkness rather than light because their deeds were evil. The word comprehend in verse 5 means to lay hold on and to claim for oneself. They do worse than that. This world will quench the light, will cover the light. That's what's happening in our world. You ever notice if, if there's somebody here that has any kind of age to them, you can remember 40, 50, 60 years ago. What TV used to look like back then as opposed to what TV looks like now. I look at TV now and I'm like, I'm ashamed to see some commercials. <laughs> Let alone a certain movie. You have to have a PG-13 or, or higher just to watch some commercials that they show nowadays. That is the world. And guess what? We ask ourselves, man, can it get any worse? I got a revelation for you. It's going to get worse. If you think right now is bad, you haven't seen anything yet. You need to ask the Lord to start showing you some things, and he'll show you. Stand with me this morning. This lost world is actively trying to quench the light to prevent it from shining anywhere. But I got news for them. The light has shone brightly from eternity's past. That light has gleamed into Bethlehem's manger. The light shined for 33 years while he walked on this earth. The light that flickered briefly at Calvary but blazed forth in the entrance to an empty tomb will continue, will continue to light the path toward eternity for those who desire to follow him. Most people, when it comes to what they think, is all about their primary concern. It's in giving the perfect gift. You need that? Yeah. There you go. Only God can do that. Only God can give the perfect gift and already has. And that's just what he did when he sent Jesus into our world. He gave us his son, the greatest gift of all time. Why wait till Christmas, the actual Christmas, when we can come before our God today? The opportunity has been placed there before you. Come and say, I have a gift of unforgiveness, Lord. And it's a gift that I, it's hard for me to give. Sacrifice. Are you willing to sacrifice like he did? He didn't need to go to the old rugged cross, you know, but he did. And he did it when we were still not even lovers of God. 
He died for us when we were at our worst. That's what he did for us. He may not have been a murderer, a prostitute, or whatever we think is crazy. But I'll tell you one thing. You still need Jesus. You could be a good person, but I am positive that there's going to be many, many good people burning in hell. Why? Because they refuse. They refuse to take the right way. Well, I believe in karma. I would hate to gamble that with my eternity. If I become a better person, then I'll go to heaven. I'll be up there with the ponies and the unicorns. With the puppy dogs and the kitty cats. We can think that way, church. The fact of the matter is, is Jesus said, I am the way. I am the truth. I am the life. And nobody, nobody gets to the Father except through me. If you want to go somewhere and it says one way, it's Jesus. He's the only way. So if you want something taken from you here today, we have, a, we have a team on each side here that's ready to pray for you. You don't have to come up here and, and, and confess the way some people do. Everybody's very different. You can go to them and they'll pray over you. They won't make a scene or a spectacle. As a matter of fact, I'm going to close out this service this morning by telling you that are watching online here today, thank you for watching. It's time for our altar call. And we want to keep it private to those who are here today. So thank you for tuning in for uh, on YouTube and on Facebook. And may the Lord bless you and keep you. And we'll tune in again, hopefully with you, next week. God bless you this morning.